Welcome, friends. Come to the garden. Our global garden, our spirit garden, where we invite us to meet every month to reflect together on what is emerging, what is true now at each moment. Together, each of us brings our piece of puzzle to build together the beautiful group mandala of the vision. Welcome. Welcome, dear friends. I welcome to our garden. Um, we didn't realize we were muted, and uh, that gave us more time to listen the beautiful sound of the birds and hear the silence. Listen to the silence. Our collective silence. This is the new uh, format for the 2025 initiative full moon meetings. Once a month, we invite us together in this space of etheric garden, etheric agora. Agora is a place uh, in ancient Greece where community would gather to share and make decisions. We invite us to come in our etheric agora, in our collective etheric temple, to reflect together on what is emerging now, what is true now, in every moment. We invite each of us bring our piece of the puzzle of our own understanding of what is emerging. That together, putting those different visions, we could come with the bigger vision. The vision of what is emerging now for humanity. This is an experiment and we believe that things will be changing in our format as we go, as we'll be listening together what is emerging. So welcome. We will start with the short alignment to recognize our collective presence in the garden. So this alignment is going to be in the form of a small ritual. So if you have a candle, please do light it. Um, 
if you don't have our candle that is on the screen. So we visualize our group, a circle of people present, linking up subjectively. And those on the other side of the veil We link together with energies of light and love and will to good. And we see the bright light in the center of the group, the light of our group soul. We find ourselves in the garden, in our group garden. that leads to the shore there is a big fire lit so we stand around it And we see this limitless body of water with the clouds in the sky above it. With the wind moving those clouds over the limitless body of the forest. And we see the rain that is coming through the crowns of the trees, the branches, onto the soil. We recognize the trees of our garden. And we see a dome of starry sky above us. And in the east, we see rising sun. We align with that light, the light of Aries coming to us and we begin our work.
Well, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. And Leslie, thank you very much for that Leaves of Moria's Garden uh, passage in the chat. And um, we're so pleased to welcome Julie, Dr. Julie Cole, Dot Maver, and Melvin Artley to this conversation. And as you know, this is uh, we're experimenting with this conversational style, um, and we're bringing varied, uh, we hope, varied viewpoints on particular topics about uh, each month. And each one is focused around what is true now and what, so what is emerging, what's true now, and what's the next step for us to take. So at some point there will be something practical that you'll be able to do. But let me quickly introduce our three guests because because um, they're really quite extraordinary and then I'll leave it over to them. So Melvin is currently living in uh, Italy. He has traveled the world <laughs> and lived in the world. Um, he is, brings together being an astrologer, he's an author, he's got a huge background in esoteric studies, physics, Chinese astrology and esotericism and industrial machinery and it brings those all together. He does write a monthly uh, astrological newsletter. So he's bringing all of that together in, um, in some very unique ways. He's also a very, um, very involved in, in uh, with a focus on Buddhist studies. Dr. Julie Kroll has been, has, uh, it's kind of hard to pin her down, but if you go good of the whole, uh, she has a Dr. Julie show, All Things Connected, and she really works with bringing um, consciousness, the evolution of consciousness and whole systems, health and a worldwide whole world view together. Dot Maver, many of us know here as an educator and peace builder, and she is really trying to inspire cooperation on behalf of the common good. You may know her as the co-founder of the Global Silent Minute, National Peace Academy, River Phoenix Center for Peace Building, and it goes on and on. Uh, her particular work is in education, politics, and grassroots community organizing face, uh, uh, focused on applied build, peace building and bringing together shared leadership. So um, before I turn it over to them, uh, let's, I, we want to have this as a conversation, but we want to have, we would love people to put their comments and questions into the chat. And so if you have a question, please type it into the chat. If it's one of those questions during the conversation that is longer, could you just please type, you know, I have a question, or if there's a longer kind of comment, I have a comment. So that we keep kind of a flow going. We're testing this new format. And um, now I, and I would also, before we start, if everybody would go to gallery view, and if you feel comfortable, please come off video, at least for a few moments. Um, we would love to be able to see you. And let's just take a quiet moment, cats included, <laughs> to scroll through the screens and, and look eye to eye with everyone here, uh, just to welcome them in and to be present to who's here. See who you know, who you don't know yet. And if you do feel comfortable even just for a few moments being on screen, we would love that. Um, if you'd like to go off later, great, that's okay, but we would love to see you for just this moment. Thank you for that. Again, the chat is there and I'm going to turn it over to Dot and Julie and Melvin. It's what is true now? And what's the next step? And off we go. So yeah, that's great. Yeah, Dot and Julie and Melvin, if you'd like to unmute. Thank you. That'd be great. Thank you, Sharon. And okay. Yeah, thank you very much. It's good to see everyone and to be able to, to be with everyone in, in the Zoom room beyond audio. 
And as our hearts connect across distance, uh, it, uh, I so look forward to this conversation today and want to give a shout out of gratitude, heartfelt gratitude to 2025 initiative uh, for daring to call us together uh, in a, an immersive experience to, to address questions together that are so timely. Given what Antonella shared uh, a while back, uh, the way it seems in, in, in my heart is that thanks to, in large part to solar lords, Jupiter and Saturn, uh, love and light, we are actually living in the prototype year for the new era. So everything we are seeding, everything we are addressing right now, and particularly as we enter this high point of the spiritual year uh, in this flow of Aries, uh, just feels of joyful import. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. So one, Julie, I don't know if you have anything to start us off or Melvin, um, but let's just throw the question in. What is true now? And we're focusing really on that breakdown in this section of the political and religious boundaries. Um, I don't have any particular question, but I know the three of you are going to have a very interesting conversation. So mm -hmm. I'll pass mm -hmm. it over to you and I'm going to monitor the chat. And if anything pops up, I'll certainly pop in. Um, I feel it would be really good to have Malvin come in and, and do the astrological understanding of, of what is true now. And then we can look at bringing that into form and manifestation of what that looks like in real life and what that looks like from science and spirituality. So it would, I think that would be really fun, Malvin. Okay, well, you asked for it. Um, <laughs> I get that question a lot. What is true now? You know, what are we to believe? Because we hear so many conflicting opinions um, amongst each other, uh, across the internet. The COVID crisis has uh, brought out a lot of different opinions, for instance. Um, we have uh, commentators across the world uh, debating about what's actually happening on the international scene. We get uh, downloads every day from the mainstream media, uh, much of which turns out to be quite biased. Uh, we can get into that later. But what we see immediately in front of us is um, being precipitated as a result of two conjunctions astrological conjunctions, the first one being the Saturn-Pluto conjunction uh, at the start of last year, which signaled the, the end of an era. Uh, it happened in Capricorn, and that happens uh, only about every 500 years. So 500 years ago, we had the rise of the West and the, the domination of the West in terms of world trade, empires, what have you. That's all shifting now. Uh, the West is starting to recede and we see a multipolar world rising up. This was signaled by the, the first great conjunction, the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in Aquarius in air signs. And Dot mentioned that this year represented a sort of uh, key year in that regard. Uh, these great conjunctions happen every 20 years. So they'll cycle through all the air signs. So we have um, Aquarius, Libra, and Gemini. And each 20-year segment represents a, a sort of uh, reassessment or readjustment in terms of what that sign represents. So what we're seeing now is, is a readjustment of all the world uh, interrelations, the the greater group relations, if we want to call it that. Um, we have uh, a lot of rhetoric flying around now uh, about uh, human rights, about um, monetary policy, uh, about perceived aggressions, 
um, perceived being the operative word. But what is actually emerging is uh, an end to overt warfare. And we're about to see a very key development this year in terms of economics, which goes to the uh, uranium transit through Taurus, which always signals changes in um, facets like trade, uh, economics, uh, finance. Uh, essentially what's going to happen, uh, we've probably all heard about the Great Reset from the World Economic Forum, but the, the reset is actually in terms of public consciousness and the consciousness of nations relative to the established order that has been. And essentially, these other nations like Russia, Iran, China, uh, various Asian nations are saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, we don't necessarily agree with your rules-based order. Uh, the, the U.S. in particular has been using sanctions as a uh, sort of weapon to change governments that they don't like. Uh, that's going to end this year uh, because the the three key Asian nations, Russia, China, and Iran, are getting ready to trade in their own currencies and bypass the SWIFT system. That system being used primarily for the enforcement of um, sanctions in, in a uh, militant manner, but world trade in another matter. So we're, we're seeing very great changes being instituted this year, especially. Uh, all preceded by the Great Conjunction last year, which signaled the, the end of the so-called rules-based order and the Western dominance. So what we're going to have instead emerging over the next 20 years is uh, a world order where we're all going to have to cooperate instead of trying to dominate. And that's actually a very good thing. This is much more in accord with uh, what was outlined in uh, Alice Bailey's books, the emergence of certain blocks. Uh, it's something I've written quite a bit about in, the, in my letters the past couple of years. But um, the, the main areas we're going to see changes are going to be in West Asia, what, what we used to call the Middle East, um, with a calming of tensions there. Uh, we're going to see very great changes in Europe, uh, probably along the lines of a north-south split over the next few years. And we're going to see receding of the attention of the U.S. from a sort of sense of empire into more an internal sort of um, reassessment, shall we say. In other words, uh, DK... Uh, the Tibetans said that uh, the United States was very much like an, in the stage of adolescence. And with all those qualities, you know, trying to control everything, um, the immaturity we see in the foreign relations, for instance. Um, so it's time for the U.S. to grow up. I'm talking about the government here more than I am the people. The people of the U.S. are, are very good actually, and when uh, the economic situation settles down, uh, we're gonna see a rise of the people's voice across the US, and this will be signaled primarily in 2026 by another conjunction, uh, Saturn and Neptune, which often brings in um, more of a, a strain of socialism, if you want to call it that, even though that's a dirty word these days in the US. But more of a more of a bottom up and top down sort of exchange between government and the people. Wow. Uh, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. What what we're seeing um, these days is not so much political conflicts as it is the resolution of the conflict between uh, capital and labor. Mm. You know, Mel. Sorry, as you're saying all this, it's a big nutshell. I, maybe yeah. 
take a let's just take a breath together and allow this to sink in and then i would like to uh, say just a word julie about the work we're involved in that speaks to just about everything that malvin just talked about but let's just take a breath together wow mm. thank you Mm. You can really feel it, can't you? And, and Malvin, the way you present this, you presence through the astrologic in a way, it's not like overwhelming. It's you kind of get it that we're in this flow and what's happening. And, you know, as you speak about, um, well, first of all, religion and politics falling apart, like in all systems break down, but mm. at the same time in all systems break through. But this donut economics comes to mind, Julie, and what we know through Sign Network, and uh, we're both involved in, and some of you on in the Zoom room here, in World Unity Week, worldunityweek.org. And many of us are looking at these very things that you just pointed to, Malvin, and one of them is donut economics, a sharing economics, and Amsterdam has taken it on as a city. Very exciting. So and other, some other cities considering uh, as well. But the other thing I, I, I want to, to say is that as we talk about leadership in these times, and Julie, you've mentioned distributive leadership, and you've also talked about just the other night on World Unity Week, you were talking about um, the way I heard it, kind of the difference between an organization and an organism. And it seems that's like when we talk about what's true and what's next, that's what really has to land. And then the final thing I'll say up front is that Jude Caravan, whom we, we love, we, says we don't have consciousness, we are consciousness. And so as we approach this conversation through that lens, Julie, maybe you'd share just a couple of those thoughts. It's so tied to what Malvin just laid out. You know, I, when I invited Malvin, uh, you know, I'm thinking about this whole astrological and, and the, the cosmic beauty, and he literally landed it like so real and so right in front of us. And so, so maybe we can lift it back up into that cosmos just a minute with, with this conversation, because I um, thank you for, for that invitation to speak this dot. Um, I, I, I want us to think in terms of being a divine cosmic super organism. So when we think of this earth and we think of what we're doing and we think of this conscious evolution, this, this radical whole systems transformation on our planet, like, like Dot mentions breakthrough, it's really important to see what I believe is true right now is that we're not creating a super organism, but we already are a super organism. And so I, I just wanna remind you a little bit about super organisms. If you understand biology, you might know all of this. And if you haven't studied biology, you may have never even heard of the term super organism, but we mostly think of super organisms when we think of bees and ants and mushroom. The beautiful opening that Alexander brought us with the trees. When you, when you understand what's going on underneath the earth, there's this whole mycelial network where everything is connected, where they share resources and share information and communicate. And they keep everything healthy. They keep the weakest healthy. They share resources so the weakest can get the nourishment that it needs. So this mycelial network that's under the ground, I like to say we are a mycelial network. So we be as this human species. And at first I'm like, oh, we're a species in evolution. We are, as a species, we are a super organism. Because what we know from biology is that every species on this planet thus far that's been in that adolescent stage that, um, sorry, my computer flipped off, that's been in the adolescent stage of the, the meanness, the developing the self, the um, competition and consumption, 
every species that goes through that phase of adolescence runs out of resources and comes to a point where they literally have to leap into early adulthood and become cooperative communities that care for all life. And so if you think about how cool is that, that biology is showing us a pathway forward that we're leaving. It's not just the US government that's in adolescence. As a human species, we're in adolescence moving to early adulthood. Many of us are in early adulthood or maybe even middle adulthood, but many are still in adolescence and maybe some baby humans. But if you think about the species as a whole, we're shifting. And a lot of that is our consciousness and our understanding of separation into unity, into wholeness. So let me just share a few things and then Dot, feel free to jump back in here. I'll share a few qualities of the superorganism and you'll see, oh yeah, we can do this. Um, number one, they what Dot mentioned is distributed leadership. All superorganisms work in distributed leadership. A lot of self-organizing distributed leadership. And if you look around on this movement in the planet of who we be right now, we're seeing a lot of distributed leadership. We're literally that mycelial network that I talk about is a trans organizational network that's beginning. You'll start hearing talk of networks of networks. We're not just connecting anymore and we're not just networking. We're networking the networks and we're weaving this higher um, web of light and consciousness on the planet to assist in this. There's also collective intelligence. And you think about collective intelligence, we're here and we're gonna harvest our collective intelligence. And there's a beauty and a superpower. When we think of what Jude Curavan says, we're, we don't have consciousness, we are consciousness. And that consciousness is um, like, like the divine intelligence that's in all life, all things throughout the cosmos. We are that. So our collective intelligence tapping into this unified field of intelligence helps us communicate as the superorganism. We're developing our individual capacities, but we're developing our collective capacities in groups. And then there's swarm creativity, which is always fun. We could go into swarm creativity now around these questions. What's true right now? What's the next right step? And we're gonna go into swarm creativity and we can really um, move mountains through swarm creativity, all super organisms, ants, mushrooms, bees, we all move into swarm creativity. And just a few more, I said, I mentioned self-organizing. Another important one, when we're talking about the economics that Malvin brought in and Dot mentioning donut economics is that we're moving into reciprocity and generosity and sharing. So all kinds of models of reciprocity, generosity, and sharing are coming in because the, the bottom line is we're learning how to live for the good of the whole. It's we're moving out of how to live for the good of me. And the only survival strategy that we have and that you have to embody right now is how do we live for the good of the whole? If your mind goes back into how do I live for the good of me, um, you'll likely have a lot of the breakdowns happening. And when you leap into how do we live for the good of the whole? How do I live and contribute to the good of the whole? That's the secret sauce. That's the recipe. And just one more thing, all super organisms have is that they create regenerative value for all future generations. So when we think of a superorganism of ants, they're thinking about the future generations of the ants. They're thinking about survival of that species. And same with the bees. But I want to move us into thinking past being a species as a superorganism and really understanding the truth that we are a cosmic divine super organism. So our connection to the earth, our connection to the trees, our connection to one another, all beings, all life, the stars, 
the sun. We're a cosmic superorganism. We're not just a human species acting as a superorganism or figuring out how to be a superorganism. We already are that. That's a lot, Dot. You asked for it. I'm going to have toss it back to you. Thank you, Julie. And I don't know, Malvin, if you want to respond uh, to what Julie's saying before, because I have a couple of things I would love to share based on what both of you have shared. Did you want to say something first? Well, just in terms of general economics, uh, we in the West especially have been in this neoliberal uh, sort of economic system, especially since uh, it started in the 1980s with uh, Reagan and Thatcher. They were, they were the mouthpieces for it, but uh, it had been brewing for a long time among the, um, the various financiers and the 1% the of the time. Um, speaking of the uh, very rich, and what we've seen since the inception of that system is the explosion of billionaires on the planet, the, the I guess you'd call it the gutting of the middle class. Uh, people don't see a future for their children, for instance. This goes to, back to what uh, Julie was saying. So what we need and, and what is bound to happen now, um, given what I described before, is that the, the neoliberal system has to uh, either be broken or to evolve into something that actually builds for the future uh, instead of thinking, how much money am I gonna, I'm not gonna make in the next 24 hours, for instance, yeah. uh, which is what you have on Wall Street. Yeah. Uh, there are certain nations who do plan for the long term. Um, uh, we call them authoritarian, but um, we can comment on that a bit later uh, in terms of rate qualities and all that. But um, the, the main thing that's changing for uh, members of this audience, uh, most all of us being Westerners, is that um, we're, we're looking at a fundamental shift in, in the way that our economic system has to change. And that has to come first from the mental levels, as we know, and as Julie was describing, and it has to begin to work at the grassroots because unless the, unless the, the garden is planned and cared for, nothing's gonna grow. So I'll leave it at that. Mm, yeah, thank you, Malvin. I, this is how I, I remember you also and know you over the years. It's always so grounded. So I love that kind of theory to practice and uh, apply what we know. And I, I just, uh, Julie, thank you for going into a bit of depth about that because yes, we are a part of a cosmic super organism. And we know as leaders that when we lead from a place of knowing then there the illusion of separateness just fa i mean separateness goes away because we get it all the time we know we live and move and have our being as leaders in that knowing that reality of our oneness the depth of our interconnectedness and i i want to say that you know so many on the planet right now uh, recognizing the uh, the reappearance uh, the coming one calling on divine intervention, invoking for evoking, knowing that the intention of the lower attracts the attention of the higher, right? So we know that divine intervention can happen in many ways, divine embodiments, uh, natural cataclysms, um, evocation of, of, of those uh, who will help emergence of inspired leadership. And of course, as, uh, as we know, the emergence of a great son of God, but only the massed spiritual purpose of humanity can, in, can evoke that, can pierce the veil. So I want to suggest, I want to submit that we have the capacity to be inspired, the inspired leadership part. 
And we're seeing that all over the planet right now. It's leadership that, as, as I said, moves through life from that place of knowing. And well, in fact, Julie, in your book, Fractured Grace, you speak, speak to that as well, from, even from a personal perspective. But it's, it is that leadership that requires looking at initiatives and networks and groups as organisms. And we know that energy follows thought. So maybe some of you are aware, many of you are aware of sociological imagination. Sharon, you called on something practical. So sociological imagination, C. Wright Mills, the sociologist who developed this. And I just recently um, learned about this uh, from Professor Lisa Huber, who's a dear friend and colleague. And so the sociological imagination is the ability to situate our personal troubles and issues within an informed framework of larger social processes. And both of you, Julie and Malvin, have spoken to that in different ways. So, for example, during the term of um, FDR, right, President Roosevelt, there was the Federal Writers Project post the Great Depression. And so they went around and gathered first person experiences. And slave research was one of those areas, which ultimately led to a book and the movie about the Underground Railroad. So I would submit that our stories, our stories have meaning and can help others. They can help repurpose pain. For example, COVID stories at present, right? And they can help inspire purpose with and for others. So from a leadership perspective now, and considering our questions for reflection, what is true? And what is the next right step? How do we clean house on this beautiful planet, specifically as, as we're thinking right now through the cardinal sign, Aries, new beginnings, new appearance of spirit and form? in the flow of this full moon and even more specifically how do we clean house in religion and politics and we know that trauma healing is needed everywhere for everyone and that happens in a variety of ways so Konstantin Stanislavski would have asked of his actors right and when, as he was working with actors the magic of what if what if we were leaders who understood that stories help us situate personal troubles within an informed framework of larger so social processes, repurposing pain and offering inspiration to live on purpose? What if we were leaders willing to embark on a journey of shared stories, bringing the ancestral wisdom to life through our own stories as servers in a time of need? A time of crisis? What if this approach were to free us in the religious and political sectors to live on purpose in the now with the truth of our sacred divinity, our oneness, our depth of interconnectedness, honoring the life in every living being and offering our unique contribution on behalf of the common good? What if? So, Sharon, I'll, I'll, I'll add something to that. You will? Okay, and then I want to take us into silence with a question, and Sharon's going to play the flute. Go get him, Malvin. Okay. Yes, we can ask what if. Um, we can also act as if. Okay, you're stealing my thunder. I love it. I love it. Go ahead. Because that's that's what a leader does. Exactly. The, the, the leader has the purpose. He, he she acts as if and gets the job done. And that's what we have to do at a community level. We have to we have to uproot the weeds from the garden. We have to sow new seed. We have to prepare the soil. Exactly. So we need people to, uh, we have to encourage people to step up and act as if. Yeah, beautiful. And so again, I would submit our stories are, are many of those stories as well. Mm -hmm. And yes, so taking what Malvin just said, Sharon, if you will take us into just a minute of silence with the flute, that would be wonderful. And let's use what Malvin is calling us to, because that's it, right? What if we were to act 
as if, as consciously. Mm. I want to put a twist in for our leadership because the challenge was to live on purpose when we think about purpose and oftentimes we think of the soul's purpose and I think we've kind of all I'm going to say in our adolescence searched for the soul's purpose what is my soul's purpose why am I here what do I have to contribute I go to Alexander's beautiful opening when he was talking about the pieces of the puzzle and our group mandala of the vision. And we went through our epoch of soul's purpose. And I want us to, I invite us to think about evolutionary purpose, our shared purpose, our evolutionary purpose, moving not beyond soul's purpose, but transcending and including our soul's purpose, the individual pieces that we have for this beautiful mandala, that now is the time on our planet, one of our next right steps is to align and adjust into evolutionary purpose, because we're all here because we share that. You showed up today because you share a vision of unity and wholeness and this next phase of our evolutionary purpose on this planet. And we get to do this consciously, which is so exciting. So I just wanted to add that in and deepen into live on purpose dot mm -hmm. to coming into shared evolutionary purpose. Yeah, yeah beautiful. And Malvin, like, there's a real sense that the, oh, Sharon, do you yeah, want to? Just a, at some point, I don't know if you want to leave space, if people have, because as soon as somebody says to me, what if, and act as if, some words start coming, and I'm um, mm. wondering, you know, to, to write down for me. I'm just wondering if that is true for others, and they might like a space to think. Can we, can we, what I do. Can we invite that? And Ava in chat says, this is a period of converging indigenous wisdom and ageless wisdom reveals truth, whoops, reveals truth from multiple perspectives for the common good. And Jeffrey says, no single monarch butterfly makes the entire migration. Each does a part. I love that too. Mm -hmm. There but are yet, several generations in that migration. <laughs> yes, yes. And in fact, our, uh, as Avon uh, well knows, and has been part of this journey uh, with World Unity Week and others as well, our indigenous brothers and sisters, um, I see, um, yeah, have stepped forward at this time and said this, we have entered the day that shall not be followed by night. So the prophecies are fulfilling. And it is, said, uh, even as you say, it, it, there is, it is like a, a revealing of the ancestral wisdom uh, through so many, through so many on the planet at this time. So can we open it up, Sharon, for others to to? Sir, I'd love people to write into the chat, or if they have something to say, just say I have something to say, or to raise your hand, and we'll try and, uh, or just take a moment and write for yourself. So we'll just leave a moment of silence for that to emerge. Okay. See what comes up.
just what if or as if, but the. Mm. Yeah, and as, as everyone is thinking, and if someone wants to share, Malvin, I'd, I'd like to uh, go back to the point you made about Uranus. I mean, it's such a significant uh, planet for world servers in Aquarius, you know, all of it. Uh, with all that is emerging that and much of which we haven't seen or fully realized yet which is why i love these conversations <laughs> but what can you comment on that you had commented on uranus uh, coming up and something will be it's inevitable right change of course mm. will be constant well we can tie this in with uh, periods of crises and the emergence of leaders too because the last time uh, Uranus was in Taurus was around the time of the Great Depression and Roosevelt had just been elected to office uh, he was having to deal with all the reactionary elements who wanted to keep things as they were but Uranus brings in the urge to better conditions uh, that's one of its primary mottos, if you want to call it that. Uh, it imposes a new order, so its actions are often seen as destructive, but it's a uh, positive sort of destruction, as, uh, as in tearing out the old rotten structure and installing the new. Uh, this is what we're seeing now, and Uranus is only about a third of the way through Taurus, so we have a few more years to go yet. It'll bring us right up to 2025. Uh, so what we're seeing now in, in this end of the stage of the forerunner, as it's called, is the, the destruction of the old order, uh, which is going on apace, and the institution of the new order, which is coming in gradually. Um, but over the next decades, we're gonna see uh, quite dramatic changes in the world and much more in line with Aquarian principles. So this is, this is what uh, Uranus is doing right now. <clears throat> and um, recently it's been squared by Saturn by aspect, uh, which is the conflict between the old and the new, the push-pull. Uh, so this, this is what we see with, uh, for instance, the the old order chafing at what the new is bringing in, and the um, the inevitable conflict that that brings between ideologies, for instance. I mean, we haven't really talked about religion yet, but uh, for instance, we just had a meeting with uh, between the Pope and Ayatollah Sistani in Iraq, which was historic because it hasn't happened in, in decades. So we see movement along these lines and we're gonna see continued uh, and quickened movement for the next few years uh, as we move more fully into this uh, Aquarian Jupiter Saturn 20 year period. Uh, so perhaps you'll wanna comment a bit more on that. Does anyone want to comment any more uh, on, on what, what was just said. Well, I'm, I am so happy to. I see Sharon, you unmuted though. Did you have yeah, some? I'm just, I'm just uh, we've got a couple of questions too. So okay. I'll, what, my one question is, you know, ha, has the pandemic accelerated the pace of the shift? I, I'm just, because it's in a way was some kind of one unknown. So that's kind of, where's the pandemic in this Uranus Taurus? Uh, it's, it's the catalyst. Uh, the system was already uh, broken. The, the um, pandemic just accelerated everything and, and showed the true face of uh, what was said. For instance, if you think back on it, um, they did a polling of the, the nations best suited to handle the pandemic. Guess who were the top two? The US and the UK. And they're the two that's done the worst. So it just shows us that uh, the system is not working for the people and it has to change. 
and now we're starting to see the uprising of, of, and the crises that are bringing forward the, the leadership. And this is what we'll see over the next uh, couple of years, I would say. I'd like <clears throat> Maria Cristina over here who would speak. You mentioned the Pope and you mentioned the donut economy. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the economy of communion, the Focaleria economy that he has been initiating or he has initiated. Um, and I will quote him, he's calling for the urgent need for a different economic narrative. The world since the present is certainly unsustainable from a number of points of view, harming our sister earth, gravely maltreating and despoiling together with the poor and the excluded in our midst, the two go together. The poor and excluded are real people. Instead of viewing them as functional or it's time to let them become protagonists as their whole and not think for them, but with them. Not for the people, but with the people. Let us not then think for them, but with them. And he goes on, I could go on. It's very powerful sharings that he initiated a conference for young people that are already, in, well, young people in their 30s, huh, uh, working in countries around the world in communities. It reminds me a little of, um, oh, when we used to send folks out, it just, the, the word just left me. But they are working, for example, in the favelas of Brazil, not looking at what they need but what they have, looking at what richness might, must, might already exist there rather than reaching out for more loans that is somewhat of a dead end. And uh, again, are being told what you have to do, you know. So economics, he goes on, is can't be se separated from human realities nor development from the civilization. Mm -hmm. So many, what is being shared here, I'm delighted to say is not unique. There is a groundswell, there is a conspiracy, it's the Aquarian conspiracy, and it's grassroots. And it is found here in Tucson in the midst of all of it. It's found, I find it wherever you go, there's wonderful people working from the grassroots. Yeah, thank you, Maria, Christina, and yeah, Julie, I, I can feel you leaning in. <laughs> yeah, I just thank you, Maria, Christina, that was beautiful. Mm. And, and I just want to like, I just want to like wrap that in back into the new DNA. If, if we think about who we've been as a species, we're moving into cooperative communities that care for all life. And that's what the Pope is saying there. This is what Melvin's been saying. And if you, if you imagine every system and structure on the planet has been built from a consciousness of separation, from the illusion that we're separate from one another, we're separate from a God creator source, we're separate from the planet. And so we could take all the resources, we're separate from the elementals and the resources. That's how we built in adolescence, the world that's breaking down right now. That's how we built our world. We were in our adolescence. And so the new DNA of what's coming through and the truth of who we be as whole and um, the divine cosmic superorganism, if you want to, to say, is that the, the DNA is about creating communities that care for all life, which therefore is the leadership has to come from the place of cooperative communities that care for all life. So I just want to pull this through, pull the thread through the pandemic. Because someone asked about the pandemic. Imagine a species that would love 
the novel coronavirus when it came. Imagine a species that saw itself as one planetary superorganism, not even cosmic, but one planetary superorganism. And how might have we responded when the coronavirus presented itself? What we watched and witnessed, which is again, an accelerator for our breakdown. So uh, literally breakthroughs are happening on every continent, in every country, there's an emergence of good, there's an emergence of initiative, there's an emergence of these cooperative communities. It's everywhere. We know that it's the swell that you just spoke of. Yet our governmental structures that come from the adolescent species responded to the pandemic with fear and separation, with annihilation. Um, Mar Melvin talked about even the weapons, um, the end of overt warfare. We declared war on a virus instead of going, ah, clean air, pure water, sunshine, vitamin D, my body can manage this. We as a collective can be friends with this. What do we need to learn from it? How is it going to change our DNA, our RNA? What is the message of it? Instead of us embracing in love and, and unity of what this virus was bringing to us, we declared war and we went back into separation from the systems and structures, which were created, we, we all watched what it created, right? So I just wanted to drop that piece in because I think it's really important for us to continue to remember what's breaking down and what is emerging is this level of consciousness and how we decide to organize ourselves as a species in cooperation with the planet and all life here, right here, right now. Beautiful, Julie. And as you're saying that, your comment earlier about networking the networks, like we've gone beyond working with individuals, groups working with groups, et cetera, and even, you know, developing networks. It really is beyond that. And the COVID virus afforded us, as John Raymer is fond of saying, we had to be separated in order to come together, in order to realize unity consciousness and, our, and the truth of our interconnectedness and oneness. And that, yeah, thank you, Maria Cristina. That is exactly what's happening. And Mikhail Crow has put in the chat, which really in a way, um, Julie speaks to what you just said and Malvin addresses your comment earlier. I think as we enter into a stage of as if and designing these new foundations, it is essential to have conversations with people we potentially are cut off from or have avoided. As of now and increasingly with digital social networks, we are often siloed in self-reinforcing cocoons. Yes. Races, political parties, intellectuals have only a part of the solution to humanity's evolution. The dissolution of singular knowers and the evolution of the collective knowing requires us to ask what others know rather than tell them what we know. It is not inevitable that the new will be positive unless we ground and root the Aquarian light without the same glamour and separation. Yeah, thank you, Mikhail. And Cheryl uh, asks, requests suggestions for stories, books, etc., for sharing this wonderful ancient wisdom for our young ones, specifically six, seven, eight, and future leaders as they are forming their worldview and learning to live from the inside out. And is she's thinking about the biology super organism that Julie shared. So I put a couple of things in the chat. Julie, you might want to add to that. Oh, I, I'm, I, I'm not aware of any books or resources right in this moment. So if I, if I think of one, I'll pop in um, for the young ones. It's, it's really tough for the young ones. Yes. And I think we are the book and we're writing ourselves right now. We are the book. And this is it. We're writing it in real time. So encourage the young ones to be a part of that. They mm -hmm. carry the wisdom. They're born into this with the new social DNA 
of, of cooperation and, and caring for all life. So, um, but if I do think of a specific resource, I'll certainly pop yeah. that back in the chat or. We the world, uh, for those who don't have access to chat, we the world.org and Karen Palmer's work. There are a few who are, are really putting out there some things for youth that, that do speak to that. So. There's a question uh, to, to I uh, probably Malvin particularly, a question about Uranus breaking up structures. And Rebecca asks, because it's in the fixed Earth sign of Taurus, will there be challenges to let go? Let it go. Let it go. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Taurus is the one sign of the zodiac that loves to hold on to things. But it's also the, the one sign that gives. Um, light on the path and with the action of uh, Uranus and Taurus we we have new light cast on the path or new paths revealed for instance um, path has different meanings for for different people but um, in terms of the spiritual path uh, you can't go past Uranus because it um, it opens up the, the new vista, the, the doorway for people to go through. And this is what we're seeing in terms of uh, Taurian structure. You know, we're, we're looking at, uh, for instance, the environment, which is very much connected with Taurus being an earth sign. And the, the mother element, you know, we have the, a lot of conversations now about uh, violence against women, for instance, and uh, the, the power of women to make changes in this world. Uh, it means a lot of things, but it's also very challenging because uh, people don't, a lot of people don't like change. Some people like roller coasters, but most people like to stay firmly on the ground. Uh, and we see this in, in governments too. You know, they, they don't like the, the new multipolar era. You know, we want to stay in control. We want uh, the status quo to remain. Uh, it's not. So, yes, it is very challenging. It does uh, break up the structures. And this is all very much needed. Mm. Mm, yeah. Wow. And, I, you know, um, Margo just put into the field, speaking of DNA and RNA, how does the vaccine play out in this mycelial species? And it was uh, maybe a week ago, this experience uh, that I had around the vaccine as the being in the midst of getting the, the various shots, et cetera. And it really touched me that we each have the capacity to be a radiatory impulse in the world. And in fact, that's who we are. And absolutely everything is a divine plaything, capital D, capital P. It's how we use it that makes it or abuse things that makes it otherwise, right? So when you, when you begin to look at uh, DNA, RNA, vaccine playing out in mycelial spe species, I went for the second shot thinking, okay, psychic energy, pour through me, everybody who I come within range of, may it be a blessing. May it be part of the healing balm for this planet because it is all part of that radiatory impulse. And what we know, and we've said it a couple of times today, and we all know this, energy follows thought. And so, Again, I submit that we share a profound, serious responsibility to think according to how, I'm going to say Malvin and what you're saying about astrology, like along those lines, and Julie, as you keep calling us back to, to the truth of what is, and the next right step, to think along those lines. 100% of the time so that and then our speech ends up matching that and then there we end up being part of the solution as solutionaries out here and helping the plan manifest consistently rather than uh, offering anything else in the field so uh, Margo that's my own answer to that I don't know if Julie or Malvin want to address it but I I actually feel really good about it if, if it's here and I want to be part of how we 
policy that so it it isn't about a lack of freedom it is about freedom ultimately everything is yeah there is something i'll add here um infections in general have a strong mental component yep. and they cause uh, an interruption in our normal life it causes a period where we have to we have to take rest we have to take the bed often and what the pandemic has done in our societies is it's caused this interruption and it's given people time to think about what is of real value in their life what um what has brought all this on uh why are we sitting here at home for instance not being supported or being supported uh, what am I going to do with my life after the pandemic passes? You know, all these thoughts going through people's head, heads. Um, so the pandemic has been very useful in terms of spiritual advancement because it has interrupted our myriad distractions of the day and caused us to sit with ourselves. And in that sense of, of being, as uh, Helen Franklin mentioned, um, we come to a new realization of a way forward that we might not have seen had this pandemic not come along. Mm. Mm. I think all good things mm. work together for the greater whole, right? All good things. I'm just going to, I just want to pause because I, when I'm, I'm thinking about where we're at and, and it's like, do we really need the answers to the pandemic? We all know this has been a significant moment in our evolution, in our, in our evolution. And I, I want to just bring us into poetry for a minute. I want to share a poem because mm -hmm. I want to move us from what if through as if to not if, but now, okay? So this is a poem, it's called Radical Participation. Inviting us to move out of the hope of something into right here, right now. On this auspicious day, today, now in perfect time, I move from hope to presence in a curious dance coalescing. Expectancy fades as the light pierces my waiting soul. The promise of union eclipsed by the co-arising universe being. The premonition of ages old illuminates the assurance of joining stories foretold one wisdom in growing aliveness. My impatience and forward looking fades into synthesis, aligned as my heart bursts forth in holiness and humanness. Divinity in partnership reminds me I am she, the light, and with deep reverence I bow and become the action. My waters flow as source, nourishing and sustaining as consciousness in service to the good of the whole. I arrive in my humble fullness, enchanted in this curious love affair as all life cooperates and comes together, caring for creation one by one. Now is the only time there is peace within the collective common good. All I can be is in awe as I wake from anticipation to participation. Oh, that you brought poetry, Julie. Thank you. Um, and just uh, going to let us all release this conversation. This is a really nice way to release. We just go to the top of the head and say, okay. And you can do that anytime, by the way. Um, and I'll ask Dot, as we might ask people to bring a practice or something that we can take with us as we go on. I'm sure you've got 
some ideas, but um, Dot has a breathwork practice and I think we'll have a short meditation that may be part of that. And then we'll have our closing ritual. Um, so I'll pass it over to Dot and see if there are any last things before that and we'll go from there. Okay. So I'm happy to do the, um, uh, we're all familiar with pranayama. It's a very simple uh, breath process that activates the immune system, the parasympathetic uh, nervous system, uh, which ties in with the whole conversation we just released. Um, but not a, it, it isn't really a meditation. So whoever's leading that, I'll just, I'm happy to set the stage. We'll all be very calm. So um, one of the typical uh, breathing processes is the four square, right? So we inhale four, we pause to the count of four, we exhale four, we pause to the count of four. And that's very calming and presencing. However, if we do a four by eight, we automatically uh, activate the parasympathetic nervous system. And that, that will assist us, not just to be calm, but with our very immune system. So let's do that a couple of times. Um, and here's how it'll work. We, it will exhale fully. And then I'll count us through it. Inhale, two, three, four, pause, three, four, exhale, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, pause. And relax. So the only thing as we do this once now is you'll want to breathe in through your nose and exhale through your mouth, which will allow you to control the length of that breath much easier than through the nose. Inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth. So we'll exhale everything. And inhale. Four, pause. Four, exhale. Eight, pause. Om Shanti. Has posted two journaling prompts. Um, there we go. And uh, Margot, there's your answer. So two journaling prompts for you all. What do I need to be fully expressed within the divine cosmic organism? What do I need to be fully expressed within the divine cosmic superorganism? Sorry. And how can I contribute to the health and coherence within the superorganism? How can I contribute to the health and coherence within the superorganism? And Julie wrote the poem, Radical Participation. Is it available somewhere, Julie? Do you have it written, posted? Uh, just in a few Facebook groups that I've shared poetry in, so no. Okay. No, not even in the books nowhere, I'm writing. Nowhere. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I could share it here, though. I can. That'd be great. Yeah. I can, can share it with Alexander, and he can... We'll yeah. send that out. Sure. And I, I hope also the three of you will send to Sasha any links and um, uh, websites and so on that we can uh, go and move to. Yeah, Sharon, do you think we still have time for a short meditation that Malvin agreed to lead us? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Malvin, a short meditation. Okay. We settled in our seats. Feel our breath moving. And see ourselves sitting in a circle 
on a high mountain plateau. For silence all around. And we feel the presence of the group members. We give gratitude for everyone being there. Give gratitude for our interconnectedness, for our strengths, our differences. In the center of the circle arises a lotus with a cushion in the middle, the color of the moon representing great compassion. And on this cushion sits a silver orb representing whatever wisdom we think of uh, as our highest wisdom. It can be a teacher, it can be our higher self, it can be the world. And as we hold hands in the circle, and energize the mandala creates this orb magnetic emits smaller orbs that settle above our heads golden vibrant ascending into our brain consciousness imbuing us with wisdom And in our hearts, we imagine the, the bliss of what the Buddhists would call bodhicitta, the great love of bodhi. And that merges with the light in the head. We feel ourselves expand below the heart, above the heart, to the right, to the left, to the front, to the back. To the extent we feel no direction or duality. And then we raise our hands to the forehead and sound the om. And in that blissful space, we move the hands next to the throat and sound the ah, the voice of wisdom. Ah. And then finally to the heart. Sound in the home. Oh. And 
this with the with union of the three principles, the Om, the Ah, and the Hum, the Monad, the soul, the personality. We expand our wisdom outward all around. encompassing our immediate environment, our communities, our nations, and eventually the world. And in that expanded space, we realize that though individual, we are all one. And in that blissful state, we radiate our own wisdom. We receive wisdom from around us. And we give out what we add. And then we slowly return And as we close, we carry the wisdom of what we just experienced out into our daily lives, in our being, acting as if, asking what if, in gratitude for all of us being together. Thank you.
If someone, if someone would like to lead the great invocation. Sasha, do I do that? I will. You can do that. Yes. From the point of light, within the mind of God, God. that light streams forth into the minds of men. Of men. That light, light is set to send. From the point of love, within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and life work out and may it seal that you will be Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Sense of time got somehow disappeared. It's, it's you know, I know Sharon, can you please bring us back to the reality of the Kronos? So, um, Melvin, Dot, Julie, thank you. Thank you. It was a really wonderful conversation. Um, if any of you have, you know, one word that you're taking with you. If you'd like to pop that into the chat, that would be great as a coordinating last moment. Mm. Just watch that stroll. That's beautiful. Mm. Clarity, journey, grace, the garden is flourishing, purpose, coherence, grateful for the shared time and insight, unity, more unity. <laughs> um, Sasha, do you have anything last to finish? Thank you, Jimmy. Courage, powerful. We'll just keep this going for a moment then. I think it's, it's, 
I know it is yeah so it's difficult to put it in like to, to the other words now. So it's maybe it's we in this silence through this silence we leave the garden and hold that sacred space in our hearts and whenever that question arises around us what is true now we could always link back to this our group space our group garden and take our inspiration and our vision from here and we take this little mala bead on our mala necklace and we take it with us to our next meeting thank you all thank you malvin thank you dot thank you julie we'll just leave the chat open for a moment if you have any last words and uh, we will see you next month blessings to you all Thank you.